Hello, welcome everyone. Today we are going to discuss uh, the cubic spline interpolation. The topics that we are going to cover in this lecture are why spline interpolation is important, cubic spline interpolation, natural spline interpolation condition, and the clamp spline interpolation condition. First of all, uh, it's important to understand why supply and interpolation is important. In the previous section, we have discussed that we can use a single polynomial to express the data on the closed intervals. However, if we have large number of data points in that case the order of the polynomial will be high and the high degree polynomials can oscillate erratically which means that a minor fluctuation or a very small portion can induce a large fluctuation over the entire time so this means that while using a single polynomial even a small modification in the input variable can produce a large change in the output value. So an alternate approach can be that we should divide our interval into a collection of subintervals, and then we construct a polynomial on each subinterval, and then we can join these polynomials at the nodes joining two intervals. This is called the piecewise polynomial approximation. The simplest piecewise polynomial approximation is that if we define a piecewise linear interpolation, which consists of joining a set of data points by a series of straight lines. So let's say we have data points x0 to xn, we can join x0 and x1 by a straight line, then x1 with an x2 by a straight line, and so on. When we join all these points together, we will be able to approximate the polynomial representing the data points x0 to xn. So, the graphically, it is similar that if I have a blue curve, and I want to approximate it by using piecewise linear polynomial. This means that I polynomial representing this portion of the curve is a straight black line. And then I'm joining the next two data points by another straight line and so on. So in some regions, our approximation is good if that portion is actually representing a straight line but if it's a curved path we can say that in this case the approximate value and the actual curve they are different so this means that the linear approximation is not a good choice to make if we have a curved graph another disadvantage of linear uh, interpolation or linear piecewise interpolation is that we there is likely no differentiability at the endpoints of the subinterval. So, which in geometrical context means that the interpolating functions are not smooth. We can use splines to deal with problem so that we can define some smoothness conditions at the points where two intervals are joining together. Like here, x1 acts as a joining point of interval x0, x1, and x1, x2. So we will define a smoothness condition at x1 to make sure that these two curves are not making an edge at x1, rather than they are smoothly joined together. Supplying so basically is a word that is derived from splint, where 
two board pieces are joined together by a small strip of wood. So that same meanings are being used here, that we are trying to join continuous curves by forcing them to satisfy the smoothness condition at the point of junction. The next thing is the cubic supply interpolation. So we can define any order polynomial to represent a piecewise function. But that we are going to discuss here is a cubic supply interpolation. So what does a cubic supply polynomial is? It is a piecewise polynomial of degree three on each subinterval of our depth. Generally, a cubic polynomial involves four constants, like we have A, B, C, and D. So a supplying interpolation or supplying polynomial is defined by Sj of x is equals to aj plus bj time x minus xj plus cj time x minus xj square plus dj time x minus xj cube. The cubic supply ensures that that the interpolant is not only continuously differentiable on the interval, but it also has a continuous second derivative. So, as we discussed earlier, that we need to make sure that our polynomials that are being defined on subintervals are smooth at the point of junction of two supplies. So we take the assumption that at the point where two polynomials are joined together, their derivatives are also equal to make sure that the smoothness condition exists. So we can construct a third order polynomial on each subinterval satisfying the smoothness interval. Now, if we have x hat, x naught to x n data points, this means that in this case, we are going to have n minus one subintervals. So we need to define n minus one supplines on interval x naught to x. So we divide our interval x naught to x n into n minus one subintervals and define a polynomial, cubic order polynomial on each subinterval. So between the interval x naught to x one, we have the first polynomial s naught. On the interval x1 to x2, we have a polynomial of cube order s1. And so on, we are going to define sn minus 1 supply on the interval xn minus 1 to xn. We can see here that x0 to xn, we have total n plus 1 number of data points, which means that in total, we have n subintervals. So we have n supplines starting from S0 to Sn minus one. The conditions that are required to determine the four coefficient values, which we have discussed in the previous slide. So how can we determine those four unknowns? So let's assume that there is a function defined on interval a to b, and we have divided this interval into subintervals x0 to xn. Now we are going to define a supply on each subinterval. So a supply polynomial should be of cubic order on each subinterval xj to xj plus 1. So we randomly choose one of the subinterval xj to xj plus 1. 
in the graph you can see that they are not equally spaced so there is a chance that they might be equally spaced or they might be unequally spaced so it doesn't matter that's why here we are using the subscript xj to xj plus one because the subinterval length will be different or can possibly be different. Now, as we already know that the supplying polynomial should satisfy the given data. This means that at any node j xj the supplying polynomial defined on the interval xj to xj plus 1 should satisfy the given function value at xj and xj plus 1 so this means that the value of sj at xj should be equals to f of xj and similarly the value of sj at xj plus 1 should be f of xj plus 1. Now, as we said earlier, that we want to make sure that whenever two polynomials are joined together, they are smooth and they are continuous. So this means that now at this node j plus 1, the supply in sj and sj plus 1 are joining together. To make sure that this is a continuous curve, we have to make sure the supplying value of Sj at Xj plus 1 and Sj plus 1 supplying value at Xj plus 1 should be equal. So, this is the second condition Sj plus 1 at Xj plus 1 should be equal to Sj Xj plus 1. I'm hopeful that you understand the relation we are getting here. This is the supply in J plus one, and this is the supply in J. At the point where these two supplies are joining together is XJ plus one node. So at the point where these two supplies are joining together, their supply value should also be equal. Now, here we have j is equals to 0 to n minus 2 because we know that s not is not further joining to any node and similarly s n minus 1 is not joining to any further node. So, j should vary from 0 to n minus 2. Now, as the supply values are equal for smoothness, their derivative value should also be equal. So, the derivative of s j plus 1 at xj plus 1 should also be equals to derivative of sj at xj plus 1. And similarly, an additional condition we need to impose is that derivative of second order derivative at j plus 1 supply should be equals to second order derivative of j supply at xj plus 1. Now, why we are imposing this additional condition? Because we said earlier, in a cubic supply polynomial, we have four unknowns. So this means that to compute all of them, we need four conditions at least for each supply. So in this case, we have n number of supplies. And each supply has four unknowns. This means that the total number of unknowns will be equals to 4n. So here we have n minus 1 conditions from here, n minus 2 conditions from C, n minus 2 conditions from D, and n minus 2 conditions for E. So we can see that we have some missing conditions still required to compute the rest of unknowns because we can only compute n minus 1 unknowns n unknowns because it's 0 to n minus 1. So n known unknowns from using this condition. We can calculate n minus 1 unknowns using these conditions, n minus 1 using this one, and n minus 1 using this one. This means that in total, we will be able to compute 3n minus 3. 
plus n. So that will be 4n minus 3. So we need three additional conditions to completely determine 4n unknown. So one of the conditions that we are going to use is that sj at xn should be equals to f of xn. So this means that we are only left with two unknowns. So for these two unknowns, we either have to use the natural supply condition or the clamped supply condition. In natural supply conditions, we are assuming that the double derivative at x0 and double derivative at xn is equals to zero, which we known as the free boundary conditions. This means that in this case, it goes straight. And similarly, x0 goes straight. For that case, the slope will, double derivative will be equals to zero. In the case, if we have some additional con information available at the end nodes, that is x0 and xn, then we can use Clamp boundary condition. So S prime at x0 is equals to F prime of x0. This means that we should be provided with the derivative value at x0 node. And similarly, the derivative value at x and no. So, we can conclude that to determine unknowns, we use required to use these a to f conditions. After using these conditions, we will be able to determine four n unknown coefficients. I'm repeating again that each supply has four unknown coefficients. So we have total n supplies. The total number of unknown is 4n. From condition B, we can calculate n unknowns and one additional by using the value that function value at nth node should also satisfy the sn minus 1th value at the last point. So in total, b condition will help us to determine n plus 1 unknown. c condition will help us to determine n minus 1 unknown because we include 0. So we have 0 to n minus 2. We will be able to calculate n minus 1 unknown. From d, we will be able to calculate n minus 1. From E, we will be able to calculate n minus 1. So this means that in total, we are able to calculate n plus 1. Here, we have n minus 1. Again, n minus 1 n minus 1. So we are able to calculate 4n minus 2 condition. So the last two conditions, either we can use natural condition or clamp boundary condition. So if we don't have any further information about our data, we have to use natural. But if we are provided with the derivative value at the initial and the last end point, then we can use clamp boundary condition. Although cubic supplies are defined with other boundary conditions, but for the present topic, we are going to stick ourselves with natural or clamp boundary condition. So in the case we used natural conditions, it's being called natural supply, or if we use clamp conditions, it is being called clamped supply. So natural supply, we can graphically assume it that we are actually bending a long flexible rod by using a 
force such that it takes the values given in our data set. So this means that we bend this curve as per the required values of our data set. So this is going to take something like this shape. And at the end points, it's going to be straight at both end points. But in general, clamp boundary conditions are more approximate because they include more information about the function. As we will solve an example, by using natural and clamped, we will see that the result of clamp boundary condition is 100% accurate, while the natural supply and condition polynomial results are also accurate but not 100%. Let's start with an example. Construct a natural cubic supply that passes through the points 1, 2, 2, 3, and 3, 5. So, we want to construct a supply by joining the point 1, 2, 2, 3, and 3, 5. So we are going to define supply polynomial. As we know that our first interval is from 1 to 2 and the second interval is from 2 to 3. So we required two supplies, S0 of x and S1 of x to define a supply interpolation. Now for the interval 1 to 2, from 1 to 2, we have a supply polynomial S0 of x is equals to A0 plus B0 time x minus xj. So in this case, the first node xj is 1. So x minus 1 plus C0 time x minus x0 squared. So it is 1 square plus d naught time x minus 1 cube. And on the interval 2, 3, we have s1 of x is equals to a1 plus b1 time x minus 2 plus c1 time x minus 2 square plus d1 time x minus 2 cube. So you can see a relation from here that for supply in s naught, we have to take the difference with the initial node 1, x minus 1, x minus 1 square, and x minus 1 cube. And on the interval 2, 2, 3, we have x minus 2, x minus 2 square, and x minus 2 cube. Now, there are four unknowns in S0 of x. There are four unknowns in S1 of x. This means that in total, we have eight unknowns. So to determine these eight unknowns, now we require eight conditions. So let's start by using the supply conditions. Now the first four conditions comes from the fact that the supply must agree with the data at each node. So we can use here four conditions. The first condition is going to be that S0 at X0 should be equals to F of X0. Now at X is equals to X0, F of X0 is equals to 2. So this means that when I substitute x is equals to 1 in S0, it should comes out to be equals to 2. When I substitute 1, it's going to be 0, 0, and 0. So the only term left here is A0. 
So at x is equals to 1, s naught should be equals to f of 1, which in this case is equals to 2. So a naught is equals to 2. Now, s naught at 2 should be equals to 3. So when I substitute x is equals to 2, a naught plus b naught times 2 minus 1 plus c naught times 2 minus 1 square plus d naught times 2 minus 1 cube, it comes out to be equals to 3 is equals to a naught plus b naught plus c naught and d naught. Now, moving to the next polynomial, S1 at 2 should be equals to 3. Now, when I substitute x is equals to 2, I'm getting this term equals to 0, 0, and this term as well, 0. So, a1 should be equals to f of x2, which in this case is equals to 3. So, a1 is will be equals to 3. Now, S0, S1 at 3 should be equals to 5. When I substitute 3 here, I will get 3 minus 2 is equals to 1. 3 minus 2 is equals to 1. And 3 minus 2 is equals to 1. So, A1 plus B1 plus C1 plus D1 should be equals to S1 at 3, which is F of 3, and in this case, equals to 5. So, this means that the first four unknowns can be determined by using the given data set. Now, but still we got four more. So we got the value of A0, A1, but still we need to calculate the value of B0, C0, D0, V1, C1, and D1. So we need further conditions to calculate them. Now we can see that the supplying polynomials should be smooth. This means that the polynomial S0 at 2 should be equals to the polynomial S1 at 2 because it is the point where both the supplies are joining together. So, for smoothness, their derivative should also be equal and their double derivatives shall also be equal. When I take the derivative of S0, I can say that derivative of A0 is 0. Here we have B0 plus 2C0 times x minus 1 plus 3D0 times x minus 1 square. And similarly, we can take the derivative of S1. So, by substituting the derivative of S0 at 2 equals to the derivative of S1 at 2, we will be getting B0 plus 2C0 plus 3D0 is equals to B1. And by calculating the derivative, double derivative of S0, we will have the derivative of A0 is 0, double derivative of B0 is 0, so we will get 2C0 plus 6d0 time x minus 1. Similarly, we can take double derivative of s1. Now, substituting x is equals to 2, we will get s0 double prime at 2 is equals to s1 double prime at 2, and that's 2c0 plus 6d0 is equals to 2c1. Do remember that to completely understand this lecture, you need to keep a notebook with you so that you can perform these steps yourself. So once you are done with, you can move to the next slide. Now, we still need two further conditions because we are able to calculate six unknowns, not uh, exactly six unknowns, but we have six simultaneous equations. So, but we need to determine eight unknowns. So, this means that we still need to develop two further equations. So, to develop two more equations, 
we need to use the natural boundary condition. So in natural boundary condition, the S naught double derivative at initial node one should be equals to zero. And S one double derivative at last node three should be equals to zero. So when we take the double derivative of S naught, substitute x is equals to one, we have two C naught is equals to zero. And when we take double derivative of S one, substitute x is equals to three, we will get 2c1 plus 6d1 is equals to 0. Now we are able to develop 8 equations and we have 8 unknowns. We can use simultaneous equation procedures to solve and calculate the values of these 8 unknowns. Or you can use backward substitution to calculate the values of these unknown by simultaneously solving the equation. Now, after solving the system of equation, we will be able to determine the value of A0, B0, C0, D0, and similarly A1, B1, C1, and D1. So A0 is equal to 2, B0 is equal to 3 by 4, C0 is equal to 0, and D0 is equal to 1 by 4. And here A1 is 3, B1 is 3 by 2, C1 is 3 by 4, and D1 is minus 1 by 4. So we are able to define a supply and polynomial over the interval 1 to 2 in the form of piecewise functions. So we have one polynomial which is S0 on the interval 1 to 2 and other polynomial S1 on the interval 2 to 3. Now, we can define a supply and polynomial for any n channel data points. So if we have n subintervals, we need to define a supply and polynomial in the form of sj of x is equals to aj plus bj time x minus xj plus cj time x minus xj square plus dj time x minus xj cube on the interval xj to xj plus 1. Now for n subintervals, we have n supply and polynomials. And we need to determine four n constants. Now, by using the first condition, supply and polynomial should be equals to the function value at any given node. So, by using this condition, we are able to get sj of xj is equals to aj because when we substitute x is equals to xj here xj minus xj is 0 xj minus xj is 0 and xj minus xj is 0 so the only term at left here is aj so this means that the unknown coefficients aj value is actually the function value at given node xj for j is equals to 0 to n minus 1 so this means that n unknown coefficients are being determined from a0 to a n sorry a0 to a n minus a n minus 1 so total n number of unknowns are being determined now at the last node we can assume that the value of a n is equals to f of x n so in total we are able to determine n plus 1 number of unknowns by using the first condition. Now using the second condition that the polynomial, supplying polynomial j plus 1 at node j plus 1 should be equals to supplying polynomial j at node j plus 1. By using this condition, what we will get is at xj plus 1, the value of aj, sj of x will be aj plus bj time xj plus 1 minus xj. And similarly, cj time xj plus 1 minus xj, xj plus 1 minus xj whole cube. But when we have j is equals to j plus 1 here, so it will become sj plus 1, aj plus 1, bj plus 1, xj plus 1, and so on. 
Now, when we substitute x is equals to xj plus 1, so xj plus 1 minus xj plus 1 will be equals to 0. So, in this case, I'm only going to be left with aj plus 1. So, aj plus 1 comes out to be equals to this thing. Now, we have used the second condition. We are going to use the third condition. But before going there, we have seen that these terms appears repeatedly xj plus 1 minus xj. So, let's assume that any in jth interval length is given by hj, which is equals to xj plus 1 minus xj. This means we can substitute hj instead of xj plus 1 minus xj. So, by substituting x is equals j plus 1 minus xj is equals to h, we will be get, getting aj plus 1 is equals to aj plus bj hj plus cj hj square plus dj hj cube. Now, the next condition, the derivative of supplying. First derivative of supplying at xj plus 1 should be sj plus 1 derivative at xj plus 1 should be equals to sj supply in first derivative at j plus 1. By using this condition, we will get this equation. I'm hopeful that you will do these steps as an activity. So you need to take the derivative of sj plus 1 supply put x is equals to xj plus 1 and then take derivative of sj supply and put x is equals to xj plus 1. Do mind that here we have j plus 1 supply and here we have j supply. When you equate them, you will get this equation. Now taking the second derivative, doing the same process, we will have another equation which is this one. Now, as we all know that the value of aj's are known, but still the values of bj's, cj's and dj's are unknown. So we need to adopt a technique where we can simultaneously solve these equations. Now, if we calculate the value of dj in terms of c's here and the values of c's, bj's, in terms of C here, we can simplify our equation. So, from this equation, which we have calculated in the last slide, we can calculate the value of BJ, which comes in term of A and C's. And similarly, by reducing the subtract j with j minus 1, we can write down in this form. So here we just replace the subscript j with j minus 1. I will discuss later why we have done this. Now, we have bj plus 1 is equals to bj hj cj plus cj plus 1. Now, Replacing here j with j minus 1. So we will be getting bj is equals to bj minus 1 plus hj minus 1, cj minus 1 plus cj. And then substituting these values of bj and bj minus 1, we will get this equation. Now here we have j varies from 1 to n minus 1. Now, in this equation, we can see that on left hand side, all our terms are in terms of c's. And on the right hand side, we have the terms in terms of a. So, we are basically, by following these steps, able to simplify our equation in term of a single unknown, which is C's, because we know that the values of A is AJ's 
is actually the function value at x j no. So this means that the right hand side is no. Now we need to vary the value of j from 1 to n minus 1 and develop a system of equation to calculate these unknowns from c naught to cn. Once the values of c's are known, we can substitute the value of a and c here to calculate the value of b. And similarly, by substituting the values of c's here, we can calculate the values of d. So, this means that we are able to calculate a, b, c, and d. So, all the unknowns are being calculated. So an activity for you that you need to perform these steps yourself and generate this equation. Now, the major question that arises is that whether this system has a unique solution or not, or does there exist any solution to this simultaneous system of equation or not? Now, I'm hopeful that you can generate a system of equation by substituting first j is equals to 1 here. So you will get one equation, then substitute j is equals to 2 to obtain second equation, j is equals to 3 to obtain third equation, and so on. Once you have done all that, you will be able to determine that the system of equation that we developed is basically a li linear system of equation in terms of ax is equals to b. Now we have a theorem for natural supplines. It says that if we are able to define unique natural supply on this and it satisfies the natural boundary condition s double prime at a is equals to zero and s double prime at b is equals to zero. So we will be able to determine a unique natural supply interval. We're not going to discuss the proof of this theorem, but this theorem proof is given in the book by Burden and Ferris. Now, by forming the system of equation, by varying j from one to n minus one, we will get a system ax is equals to b, where a will be this matrix x will be this unknown vector and b will be this column vector now here you can see that you have first and the last additional rows because in this equation when we substitute j is equals to one you will get h naught c naught plus two time h naught plus h1 c1 plus h1 c2 so this means that it actually represents the second row so the first row and the last row they comes from the point by taking double derivative at a is equals to zero and double derivative at b is equals to zero so when you will take the double derivative of supplying s naught the only coefficient that's left here will be one and when you take the double derivative at sn minus one supply the only coefficient that will be left is cn but on the right hand side we have equals to zero so the first and the last row are zero in between these first and last row these equations are generated by expanding this equation for the values of j from 1 to n minus 1. So an activity for you again to expand this system of equation to form this. From application point of view, what's important is to know the values of h0, h1, h2 hn minus 1 and the values of a2 a1 and similarly an minus 2 and an 
Now, the values of A2 is basically the function value at X2 node. And the value of A1 is the function value at X1 node. And the A0 is the function value at X0 node. This means that this right hand side is completely known to me. And on the left hand side, the C0 are unknowns. And I can calculate the value of A by substituting the values of H0, which is the interval length from X0 to X1. H1, which is interval length from X1 to X2. So this means that I can calculate the value of A, the value of B, and then I can use already well-known approach to calculate the value of unknown C0 to Cn. And in linear algebra, you already studied the techniques to solve the simultaneous system of equation. So you can use one of those to solve this system of equation. Now we are going to apply this approach to an example and see that how we are able to develop this system of equation and then we will be able to discuss about supply. Now the advantage of forming this system of equation is that we will be easily able to program it and then we can use simple solve commands to calculate these unknowns. And the other advantage is we don't need to remember all those conditions of supplies. So we can directly just put the values of interval lengths here, the values of function values at given nodes here, and develop this system of equation. And then use one of the linear algebra techniques to obtain the solution. So I don't need to substitute or apply each of the supply and condition to develop this system. Rather, I can directly develop the system and then solve it to develop the polynomial. Now let's say we want to supply and interpolate the function e raised to power x by using natural supply condition. So we have the data points 0, 1, 1 e, 2 e square, and 3 e cube. Now, as we know that we have 1, 2, 3, and 4 data points, there are going to be three intervals. And on each sub-interval, we are going to define one supply. So we are going to have an S0, S1, and S2 of, of x. So in this case, I need to calculate the values of A0, A1, A2. B0, B1, B2, C0, C1, C2. Now, coming to the matrix A, first row is 1, 0, 0, 0, and the last one is 0, 0, 0, 1. Now, in the middle node, we have H0. As we can see that in this case, we have equally spaced data. This means that H0 is 1, H1 is 1, and H2 is 1. This means that the value of H0, H1, and H2 is equals to 1. Now, by substituting the value of H0, H1, and H2 here, we will obtain a matrix given here. So 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 4, 1, 0, 0, 1, 4, 1, and 0, 0, 0, 1. Now coming to the right hand side, we know that the function value at x0 is a0. The function value at x1 is a1. The function value at x2 is a2. And the function value at x3 is a3. By substituting values of a0, a1, a2, and a3 here, we will have a vector b. And in this case, we have the unknown c0, c1, c2, and c3. So by putting it in the form ax is equals to b, we can calculate the values of c0, c1, c2, and c3. So c0 and c3 are 0, 
the value of C1 comes to be 0 0.75 and C2 comes to be 0 0.5, 5.83. Now, we are able to compute the values of C's. We have known values of A's, but still we need to calculate the values of B0, B1, B2, B3, and D0, D1, D2, and D3. As we have discussed earlier, now we are going to use these conditions. So in this condition, when we substitute J is equals to one, we will get B0 is equals to one by H0 time A0 minus A1 minus A0 minus H0 by three times two C0 plus C1. So as we have found the values of A's and C's here by substituting the value of B0 comes to be 1.46. Similarly, when we put J is equals to two, we will get B1. When we put J is equals to three, we will get B2. So once B0, B1, and B2 are known, we can calculate the value of D0, D1, and D2 by using this expression. So by substituting J is equals to zero here, we have C1 is equals to C0 plus 3D0 H0. As all other values are known, we can calculate the value of D0 from here, which comes to be 0 0.25. Then by substituting J is equals to one, we can calculate D1. And J is equals to two, we can calculate value of D2. So once the value of A0, all the unknowns are calculated, we can write down the natural cubic supply form of exponential function as such. Now, which is S0 polynomial, second one is S1 polynomial, and third one is S2 polynomial. We can see that the value of A0 is one, value of A, B0 is 1.46, value of C0 is 0, and value of D0 is 0 0.252. Similarly, here we have A1, B1, C1, and D1. A2, B2, C2, and D2. By substituting all those values in supplying polynomials, we are able to get this supplying interpolate. Now, if we plot this supplying interpolate, over the interval 0 to 3, we will get this blue curve. And when we compare it with the graph of an exponential curve, we can see that somewhere we have a good approximation, but somewhere it's a little away from the actual curve. So, now when we will apply the clamp condition, in that case, these two curves will be overlapping each other. Now, if we summarize this example, which we have discussed here, we can conclude that in this case, if we know how to solve a system of equation, it's very easy to develop this system of equation without applying or even knowing the conditions required for supply and interpolation. And then by back substitution, we can calculate all the unknown. So we have reduced our time to solve the problem. Now coming to the clamp supply and interpolation. Let's assume that the example that we have done earlier, we know the condition at the initial point one, S prime at one is equals to two, and the derivative condition at the last node is S prime at three is equals to one. Now, as we are provided with the additional condition at endpoints of the intervals, we can apply clamped supply. 
Now, when we divide our interval one, two, three into sub intervals, we have one to two, one interval and two to three, another interval. So we need to define two polynomials S naught and S one of X on each sub interval. Now on each sub interval, we need to determine these four unknowns. So in total, we have eight unknowns and we can calculate them by applying the supplying condition. Now, to dwell first six conditions, sorry, to dwell for six equations, the conditions will be same that we have already applied for natural supply. Only the last conditions are going to be different. So, as you see highlighted values, we have A naught, we have this equation, up to this equation, they are similar that we have got in natural supply. And even these two conditions are similar. So only thing that's going to be different here is the last condition in which we have the derivative of S naught is equals to two, which results in B naught is equals to two. And that derivative of S one at three, which results in this equation B1 plus 2C1 plus 3D1 is equals to one. So what we did here, we take the first derivative of S0, put X is equals to one, substitute equals to two, it results in an equation B0 is equals to two. Take first derivative of S1, put X is equals to three, and solve it, we will get this equation. Now, once we are able to develop a system of equations, then you can solve them, to determine a naught, b naught, c naught, d naught, and similarly a1, b1, c1, and d1. By substituting those values in s naught of x and s1 of x, we will get this supply and interpolate. Now, in this case, we can see that the coefficient values are a little different from what we got for supply, natural supply and interpolate. Now, in this case, Once again, we can directly develop a system of equation without applying these conditions. So for that, we have a theorem 3.12, which states that once again, we have a unique clamp supply and interpolant satisfying this condition. So we are not going to discuss the proof of this theorem. We are directly going to apply these conditions and develop a system of equation. Now, without going into much detail, what we got by applying the clamped condition at initial point, we have two H naught, H naught zero, zero, zero. And at the last S n minus one node, we will get H n minus one and two H n minus one. The rest of the equations, they are similar. Only the boundary conditions are going to change. So we can see that the in between the first row and the last row, the values of B are similar, but we have got for natural supply. The first is when we took S naught prime at X naught is equals to F of X naught. So X naught here is equals to A. So by solving that equation, we have this and by solving S n minus one prime at xn is equals to f prime at b, we will get this additional term. I'm hopeful that you will be able to understand if you go and read the proof of theorem 3.12 in your textbook. Now, Let's say we want to use this system of equations to develop a clamped supply and polynomial for an exponential function. Now, in this case, once again, we have equally spaced data. So H naught, H1 and H2 is equals to one. And the value of A naught is equals to F of X naught, which is one value at a1 is equals to e, value at a2 is equals to e square, and value at a3 is equals to e cube. 
by mistake in the book we have a naught is equals to zero so it's not actually a naught is equals to zero it is a naught is equals to one so please make this correction in your textbook as well now by substituting these values of h naught h1 and h2 here we will get two one zero one four one one four one so we can see that a pattern of one four one goes till this last line and in the last one row we have one and two so we have two one zero zero one four one one four one and zero zero one two because in this case we have n is equals to three so these three represents we have three supplying polynomials similarly on the right hand side by substituting the values of a naught a1 a2 and a3 we will develop this vector b now by solving ax is equals to b we will have this system of equation now we can use any of the known techniques to calculate the values of c naught c1 c2 and c3 so which comes to be 0 0.4 1.2 3.35 and so on. similarly as we have discussed earlier for natural supply by back substitution we can calculate the value of b naught b1 and b2 and similarly d naught d1 and d2 once the values of all unknown coefficients are determined by substituting them in supply and interplant we got s naught s1 and s2 you can see that this coefficient represents a naught a1 and this is a2 similarly we have b naught b1 and b2 c naught c1 and c2 d naught d1 and d2 now in this case if we try to plot a graph an exponential curve and the supply and interplant on the interval 0 to 3 we can see that they are so similar that no difference can be observed that's why we haven't plot the graph here because they are 100 percent matching each other now as we have discussed earlier that the higher order polynomials can largely fluctuate with a little variation in the input data. To observe that fact, let's consider the graph of a bird. Now, in the, the geometry of Rudy duck can be given by these data points which represents actually the upper part of the curve. And you can see that it's largely varying as you move from one to 30. Now it's increasing, it's decreasing, and increasing and decreasing and depressions. So now if we try to plot this curve by using Lagrange interpolation, we will be developing a 20th order polynomial and even a small variation in data will generate a large peak in Lagrange polynomial. Now, an activity for you. Perform Lagrange interpolation for this data and then perform cubic supply and interpolation for this data to see whether the Lagrange interpolation output comes closer to this actual geometry or the supply and interpolation polynomial comes closer to the actual geometry. I'm sure it appears to be a challenging task for you, but now you need to make sure that you are learning the programming skills. So to use MATLAB to do this Lagrange interpolation as well as the cubic supply and interpolation because you have a higher order polynomial of 20th degree for Lagrange and you have 20 supply and interpolation for interpolants, which means that you have 80 unknowns. So you can't do them manually. Once you have done that, 
you will observe the following that the output of the cubic supply interpolation is 100% matching with this geometry of the bird. But once you generate the geometry by using Lagrange polynomial of 20th order, you will observe something like this. And you can observe that with a very little fluctuation between 1 to 1.5, we have a large variation in the output function. And the same goes near the endpoint. So what we have observed is that the supply interpolation, which is a piecewise interpolation, is better as compared to a single polynomial to 12 over the range of 1 to 20. So we can finally conclude that it's better to use supply interpolation of cube order as compared to develop a higher order Lagrange polynomial if we have large number of data points. Some frequently asked questions. Is supply interpolation better than Lagrange and divided difference interpolation? I'm hopeful that the last activity has answered this question. Is natural supply better or clamped supply better? In the example, we have discovered that the clamped supply interpolation is better because it requires additional information about the function. If there are n number of data points, how many supply polynomials we have to define? So in that case, we need to define n minus one supply and polynomials. So number of supply and polynomials is equals to the number of sub intervals. What is the smoothness condition in supply? As we have discussed in the beginning of the lecture that we need to define that the derivatives at the points where two supplies are joining together must be equal. Is supply and applicable to equally spaced data or unequally spaced data? In this lecture, we have discussed that it is valid for equally spaced data and for unequally spaced data. So in when we have an equally spaced data, in that case, the interval length H0, H1, H2 are going to be equal. And for the case of unequally spaced data, we have different values of interval length, H0, H1, and H2, so on. Can we construct quadratic supplies like we have done cubic supplies? Yes, it's possible. In that case, we might not need as much conditions as we require for cubic supply interpolation. Can we define some other conditions at the end points other than natural or clamped conditions? Yes, it's possible, but we haven't covered that in this lecture. So you, Basically, we need to calculate the values of unknowns. So it doesn't matter whether we calculate them or how uh, by using natural or clamped, or we have some other conditions to calculate them. Our interest to calculate the values of unknown coefficients. At last, some assignment question. The first one is we need to use clamped cubic supply and interpolation for to determine the distance time graph between B to D. So we have to develop supply and polynomials over the interval B to D. We can see that we have to define two polynomials, S0 over the interval B to C and S1 over the interval C to D. Second part, write down the natural supply and conditions at A and F. So natural supply and conditions must be that the second derivative of distance at A and F should be equals to zero. Next question is, we are given that S of X is a cubic supply and interpolation polynomial, which here is being represented by Q of X, which is given to be one plus AX, two X squared minus two X cubed, and here we have two unknowns A and B. Suppose that this polynomial interpolates the function at x0 is equals to zero 
x1 is equals to 1 and x2 is equals to 2 by clamped cubic supply. We need to estimate the values of f prime at 0 and f prime at 2 by finding the values of a and b. We know that when we take the derivative at 0, we will get one first term derivative is 0, second term derivative is a, third term derivative is 4x, last derivative is 6x. When you substitute x is equals to 0, we only get a. So this means that when you compute a, you actually compute the value of f prime at 0. And when you calculate b, you actually calculate the value of f prime at 2. Now, we have two unknowns in supply interpolation. So as we know that for the supply, it must satisfy the smoothness condition. What we can do is take the derivative of S0, or in this case, we can say Q0, and take the derivative of Q1 at x is equals to 1, put them equals to 0, and develop one equation. And similarly, take second derivative, put them equals to equal, and calculate the second equation. You have two unknowns. You need to develop two equations. You can use smoothness condition and the double derivative condition to develop two equations to calculate a and b. The natural cubic supply interpolation of the function is given by this. We need to calculate the value of a, b, and c. So once again, we have three unknowns. This means that in this case, we are going to use three conditions of supply and interpolation, cubic supply and interpolation to develop a system of equations and then solve it to get the value of a, b, and c. The last question. A basketball player throws the ball towards the goal post passing through the following points. Where x is the horizontal distance from the goal post and y is the vertical height of the ball. Use clamped cubic supply interpolation to predict the trajectory of the ball. Determine whether the player of the opposite team is able to intercept the ball or not. If the middle hand coordinates are 2, 10. So, don't worry about the last part. First, what we need to do is perform clamped cubic supply and interpolation. We have three nodes, x, 5, 3, and 1. So, we are going to develop a supply polynomial S0 of x and S1 of x. Once we are able to develop these polynomials, now we need to determine whether the ball goes through the coordinate 2, 10 or not. If the ball passes through these coordinates, then it is going to be intercepted by the player. But if not, in that case, the ball is not being intercepted by opposite team. So, as we all know that the coordinate 2 lies between 3 and 1. So this means that in this case, we are going to determine whether when we put s x is equals to 2 in S1, do we get the value equals to 10 or not? If we get the value equals to 10, in this case, the player is going to intercept the ball. And if the outcome does not come to be 10, the player will not be able to intercept the ball. That's all from my side today. Hopefully, you will have a good interactive session. Thank you.